I'm Lola Blanc. And I'm Megan Elizabeth. And we're the hosts of Trust Me, the podcast about cults, extreme belief, and the abuse of power. Now on Podcast One. We're real-life cult survivors. And we're here to tell you anyone can join a cult. If you've ever dived headfirst into a new self-help program, or believed wholeheartedly in a spiritual practice, or even just trusted someone with your life, guess what? You're just as susceptible as everyone else. No one is safe, especially not Megan. I'm the most susceptible. We want to debunk the myth that people who join cults are uneducated or naive or broken, because anyone can be manipulated by a narcissist or feel good in a new group they've joined. (laughs) And we should know we both have been. Join us every week as we explore the the world of extreme belief, talk to survivors and experts, and share our own experiences with cults and the abuse of power. Don't be fooled, you might be next. Get new episodes of Trust Me every Wednesday on Podcast One, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, a real estate agent goes to meet a couple to show a million dollar house, but she never comes home. Who murdered Lindsay Bouzier? Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my homely co-host, Alice. Are you just trying to take me down a notch? Because you don't, <laughs> you're, you run out of words. There are no more superlatives in the world <laughs> that you had to take me down a notch. Is that what's going on? Are we, are we no, seeing some jealousy? You know, <laughs> no, it's like. You know, you made me feel like home, <laughs> Alice. I think you need to look up that word, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the sentiment, Brett, but I know you have much more mastery of the English language than that. So nice try, Mr. Sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying, I don't know why you're so upset. You know, home is a good thing. Home is a good thing. It's the kind of thing that people, people want to come home to. You know, I mean, come on. Come on, Alice. Somebody's You're misleading being everyone who's trying to use our podcast to learn new words. So uh-huh. look up the definition of homely yourself, you guys. Well, it's a good anyway. thing that I love you anyways, and I forgive you. Well, thank you, Alice. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Alice, I think Alice currently has a little baby with her. So if you hear little coos and oohs and ahs, you'll know, you'll know why. She's this not is, homely yeah. at all. She's not homely at all. No, she's not. She's She's... Just like her mother, she's a wonderful little girl. We're so very happy do to know have the, third you host. You do know the definition of homely. Ha, gotcha. I, what are you talking about? I'm just, <laughs> you're a wonderful person. That's, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Anyways, anyway. people, people came. People came for Lindsay Buziak because this, guys, this is a great, by great, I mean terrible, but such an interesting case. And I'm really glad we're looking into it. Who who suggested this one, Brett? Because I know we got a few oh. requests for it. Yeah, I mean, this one's been requested by a lot of different people. If if you're one of the people who requested it, it it's it's one of those true crime stories that is so well known because there is so much mystery to it. And it is a tragic case, and it's a really controversial case. And I will tell you, and we'll get into this more as we go through this. I mean, there are a lot of lessons to be learned about covering true crime. If you're out there and you want to do a true crime podcast, there are some some real stories to learn from when it comes to the Lindsay Bizier case. We're going to talk about that some. I do want to say, if you have not listened to Murder on the Island, it's a great podcast. It's a reinvestigation of the Lindsay Bouziak case by a local journalist with Capital Daily which is in the area where Lindsay was killed, they actually go into some of these problems that arose because of some of the coverage of this case. And this is a case where there are probably a lot of things you have heard that aren't true 
a lot of mistruths, misleading information. And unfortunately, some of it comes from the family of Lindsay Buziak herself. And we've said this before, you got to always remember who the victim is in these cases. The, the primary victim is the person who is killed or the person who is missing or the person who had a crime committed against them. The family members are absolutely victims. That should be remembered as well. But there are times when these cases become really complicated from an interpersonal standpoint. You can have families who are fighting amongst each other. You can have family members who go off on a tangent and are absolutely convinced of something that's absolutely not true, and it actually can do damage to the case. And I think you've got some of that here. We're going to talk about that as we talk about the case. But for those of you who don't know, we're going to go through the story as well. And it is a story that it's going to grip you because it is, in many ways, so bizarre. Everybody knows real estate agents, it can be a dangerous job. You're going out there to meet strangers in an abandoned house, essentially. So... There is some inherent danger to that. Sorry if you're a real estate agent. Don't mean to scare you, but you know this danger. You live with it every day. And Lindsay Buziak is not the only real estate agent who's ever been murdered on one of these trips. And unfortunately, it happens a good bit. But I don't know that it has ever happened like this. A lot of times, it's someone who targets the person personally for some sort of sexual or personal reason. This is very different. And I think that's one of the reasons it's become such a highly requested case. And so we're happy to cover it and happy to to hopefully shine some light on this case. It is a case that should have been solved. I feel strongly about that. And hopefully one day, even if for reasons we'll discuss, it is difficult, if not impossible, to put the people responsible behind bars. Hopefully at some point, Lindsay's family, both her, her natural family and her family that was about to become her in-laws, Hopefully, all of those people will will find justice and find peace. But with that, Alice, why don't you tell us a little bit about Lindsay Buziak? Let's take us back to the early days of 2008. Lindsay Buziak was at the beginning of an exciting time in her life. She was only 24 years old, and she'd recently begun to work as a real estate agent in Victoria, British Columbia, on Vancouver Island absolutely beautiful there. And she was really good at it too. Her colleagues loved her and she had all the makings of someone that would be very successful in her chosen career. I mean, real estate is like the ultimate salesperson job, right? Because it has to be personal. People are usually buying their primary home and it's a huge investment in their lives. And the real estate relationship is really, it becomes personal. A lot of people become friends with their real estate agents and it's it's an integral part of someone's lives. Most people don't don't buy houses willy-nilly. You usually buy houses maybe once in your lifetime, if even that. And so she had the personal touch. She had the light. You know, we talk about victims talk like that all the time. But I really do. I mean, look at pictures of her. You can tell she's just full of life, full of energy. And I think that's that's backed up by what her coworkers would say about her. I think Alice is right. This sounds like a cliche when you start. But in reality, everybody thought Lindsay was going to be fantastic at real estate for this very reason. She was very personable. She was very friendly. Everyone loved her. And she really had no enemies. She's not the kind of person frankly, that you would expect would end up in a story like this. And that's a great point, Brett, because real estate, especially when you start getting to the high dollar properties, it can become very cutthroat because obviously it's a limited market and real estate agents work by commission. And so there is competition to fight for that commission, to fight for those kind of high dollar properties. But here she was so friendly to everyone that she didn't kind of fit into the typical mold of backbiting or, or turf wars. And, you know, it wasn't just her career that was going really well, her personal life was going great too. She had a serious boyfriend, Jason Zalo, with whom she seemed to have the perfect relationship. And, you know, for what it's worth, Jason was wealthy. His family was also in real estate, and it was on the owning side of the business. His family was both prominent in the community and certainly not hurting for money. In fact, Jason's brother and mother were both established in real estate, something that made Lindsay feel comfortable in the family since they had this entire thing in common. And it just seemed perfect. Everything was perfect until, like so many of these cases, it wasn't. So it was the end of January of that year, 2008, when Lindsay got a call from a woman looking to buy a house. She and her husband were in a hurry, 
and they had cash to burn, which is basically the perfect situation for a real estate agent. I mean, this is the call you want to get. We got lots of money and we need to buy something. So we're not going to be too picky. It's essentially what you're hearing here. And since they're going to spend so much money, you're going to get a nice commission. And in fact, they told Lindsay that they could spend and wanted to spend around a million dollars on a home. They wanted at least a three bedroom, three bath home with room for a servant. Lindsay could tell the woman wasn't from Canada. Her accent was obviously foreign and she would come to call her and her husband the Mexicans. She assigned the name Million Dollar to the phone number and she actually had a total of 11 calls with the phone. For someone just starting out, this was a massive opportunity for Lindsay. We're going to talk about this a lot, but I think it was around $50,000 she was looking to make on this if she sold a million dollar house. And that's, that's great. You know, a lot of times it takes a long time to sell a lot of houses to get up to that level. Even in a really nice area like Vancouver Island, this is still a fantastic opportunity for her. But there was something about the call that unnerved her. She got the feeling almost that, man, this just seems too good to be true. She was new in real estate. She hadn't been doing it for a long time. And all of a sudden, the kind of opportunity that normally would fall in her future mother-in-law's lap is coming to Lindsay. So she asked the woman, how did you get my name? And the lady said that one of the people in another deal Lindsay had worked on had recommended her. And there are some And another thing that's going to happen a lot in this case, we're going to tell you facts and we're going to qualify them because you hear different things from different people, different things are reported in different outlets, and it's never entirely sure what is 100% true and what isn't. It has been said that the name of the person that was given to her was, in fact, someone that Lindsay had been involved in a real estate deal with before. And Lindsay attempted to call this person to confirm this, And that person was out of the country and was unable to get back to Lindsay before the events we're going to talk about. Is that true? I would like a little bit more confirmation of that, frankly, because I actually think it's important if this person, this woman who called Lindsay, did know the name of a potential client. So they can't say that for certain, but it is something that I've seen reported in fairly reputable places. So for now, we'll we'll put that out there, but just know This lady had an answer for when Lindsay asked, why me? Why are you calling me? She was ready for that question. And I think that's relevant that she was ready for the question because in this world of real estate, with Lindsay being only 24 and having a client who's looking to spend, you know, once you hit the million dollar mark, it's kind of like the next section. You know, a lot of people look at spending that way because it's a mental thing. It's really, it doesn't really even have to do with money. When I know when we're looking for houses, the real estate agent even explained it to us like that. There are certain thresholds of money that people, you know, demand to stay under or go over something like 500,000, 750,000, a million. A million is a big one because that obviously goes into the million you know, stratosphere, all of a sudden you're looking at millions, even if it's just one million. And so for her to get this opportunity, oftentimes people will only go to real estate agents that they've heard of, that there's some personal connection to. I mean, honestly, it's a lot like a podcast. You learn about real estate agents based on personal recommendations. And I know that real estate agents that I know in my life, they want to know who recommended them because they'd like to properly thank them. You know, you don't always know the effect that you have on people. And it's good to know who are your salespeople out there so you can continue to to let them know that you appreciate them so that they can continue to recommend you to other people. That's how a real estate agent's book of business grows. Their reputation grows because of word of mouth and certainly from former clients. So it's really interesting if this particular person did know the name of a former client. Now, what this answer was, it's a reasonable explanation. And like we said, Lindsay wasn't really buying it because she did want to know how she got this great opportunity. And not only could she not get in touch with the person the lady named, she actually called her other clients just to see if maybe another client had recommended Lindsay to this woman. And none of them knew this woman. Lindsay told Jason about it, explaining that she felt like something wasn't quite right about all of this. But Jason laughed it off. He reminded Lindsay that she'd make a lot of money if the deal went through, far more than she'd make on any of her other sales. How could she turn it down? This was really the opportunity of a lifetime, especially at this point in her early career. 
and Jason made a deal with her. If she set up the deal, he would go with her. And so she did. She exchanged upwards of 10 calls with the lady, eventually setting up a meeting for February 2nd, 2008. Lindsay found a number of houses, but the first one she wanted to show was a new construction in the suburb of Sanic, in the north part of Victoria. Lindsay set up the meeting, and the lady told her that she might or might not be there with her husband. And, you know, of course, this is one of those things that becomes controversial with Lindsay's fiancé about what he said, when he said it, what Lindsay said, what advice he gave to her. And I am sure it's one of those things where he probably regrets to this day advising her to go ahead and do this rather than trust her gut. I will say this. He, at this point, is a little equivocal about whether or not Lindsay was actually concerned and often sounds more like she wasn't really worried about it from a safety perspective. Maybe she thought it was a little weird. She was nervous about it because it was such a big deal, but it wasn't one of those things where she was afraid for her, her safety. Like she needed him right by her side to protect her. Now, as we're going to note, he will show up that day. So he did come to the site just too late. And Brett, it's very possible that Jason is telling the truth there, too, because I will say when I think something is very serious, even if I have really deep fears, but it seems a little bit far fetched, I don't let on to those around me the full extent of my fears. So it's very possible that what he's saying is is right, that maybe she she expressed some sort of like, I don't know, this seems out out of left field. I'm not exactly sure why. But he, but he may have understood her and she may have, you know, not said the explicit, which is she was worried that this was something bigger than that. But she may not have even given words to her actual worry because it seemed so far fetched because I would think I was being silly if I'm like, gosh, this is opportunity of a lifetime. Here I am listening to too many true crime podcasts and thinking I'm going to be a murder victim. So I can imagine she didn't actually say the words, even if she felt it. I mean, that makes 100% sense. And we talked about this a lot, how people often have feelings that they ignore or they don't want to share because they don't want to seem foolish. And this happens all the time. So yeah, I think it's possible that what happened here is she may have mentioned to him that she was nervous about it once. And he probably did respond, oh, it's probably not a big deal. And then from that point forward, even if she remained nervous, she didn't really say anything to him because he probably was right. It probably was silly. Even if in her, sort of in her heart or in her head, she's still having concerns. I mean, it's just so typical that you wouldn't want to seem like a crazy person, particularly to your fiancé. So... I think both things are possible. And especially to your fiance who is in kind of the upper echelon of the real estate world, right? They own many properties, businesses. So businesses are going to be on the high dollar end, probably much more than a million. And so this type of situation, it's all about context, right? Jason and his family probably see these types of deals left and right because of the types of properties they deal with. And it's not out of the ordinary. Whereas from Lindsay's perspective, 24 years old, just starting out, probably dealing with like single family homes that are a fraction of a million dollars. Put it into context, this is kind of so out of the stratosphere for her. You can understand why she felt the uneasiness where Jason may have, he could have been completely reasonable and laughing it off because he sees these types of deals all the time, but kind of forgetting what context it's coming in. Well, whatever people were thinking and whatever the concerns were on the appointed day, Lindsay and Jason, they head out to the location of the house that Lindsay was going to show, but they didn't go together. Jason had to swing by a mechanic with a friend of his from work who he also played sort of semi-professional hockey with, who was doing a business deal there at this location. And because of that, he was running a little late, and he let Lindsay know that he'd be a while. And Lindsay decided to go on without him. And this is another area that's a little fuzzy. There are times when you hear this, this situation described as, Lindsay really wanted to do this on her own. She wanted to close this deal on her own, which you also can imagine why that would be true. You're new in the business. You don't want people holding your hand. You want to show that you can close a million dollar deal. It's not just about the money. As Alice was saying, your reputation in real estate matters so much. She closes this deal. She does it on her own. Everybody around her is going to respect her more. She's going to get more deals like this. So you can imagine why she would want to do that. So it isn't surprising to me that she would go on without him, even if in the back of her mind, she's still having some of that concern 
about this whole thing. Another thing that would have made her feel a little bit better. This is supposed to be a couple. She's talked to a woman on the phone. And the woman has indicated she's going to be there. Her husband might be there. But you would think Lindsay's going to feel more comfortable meeting with a woman and probably more comfortable meeting with a couple. If it were a solo man, totally different situation. Totally different situation. Whether it should be or not, Lindsay would have felt more comfortable in this sort of situation with a couple that appeared to be the kind of people she would expect to see. And she arrives at the cul-de-sac where this house is at D'Souza Place. Now, she's expecting to meet the woman that she had met with on the phone, and she was there, but she wasn't alone. Her husband had been able to come with her after all. And we know this because there are two witnesses who see Lindsay meet with these two people, and they would later describe these two people who met with Lindsay. One was what they would describe as a white male, around six feet tall, with dark hair, well-dressed. Same thing with a woman. It was a woman. She is described as blonde. She was in her late 30s or early 40s. She was wearing sort of a, a colorful dress. The dress is often described as sort of a colorful dress that looked as though it might be a fancy dress, the kind of dress you would expect someone who made this kind of money, was willing to spend this kind of money, would be wearing. And the witnesses said one of them, I think, was walking their dog. The other one was driving through the neighborhood. They said they saw Lindsay greet these two people. They seemed like old friends and they walked into the house together. I think what we're hearing here is that they looked the part. The couple who was supposed to buy a million dollar home looked the part. They looked like they could pay it. They dressed like it. They carried themselves like it. It doesn't surprise me that witnesses thought they looked like they knew each other, Lindsay and this couple, because that was her personality. If you've ever met a real estate agent, a good one makes you feel right at home. They greet you warmly. It's like your old friends. They find common interests. And remember, they've already spoken about 11 times at this point. So they're not starting from nowhere. They have some base of knowledge of each other. And I also completely empathize with Lindsay wanting to go ahead on her own. First of all, she had an appointment, so she couldn't be late, even if Jason had to go somewhere else. So of course she had to be there. And also, you know, as you get closer to your quote unquote fear, you begin to talk yourself out of any any weirdness. After all, she's not meeting in some seedy neighborhood. She's meeting in a very nice neighborhood. And she's looking at a million dollar home with a woman she's talked with about a dozen times on the phone already. If she had any doubts, I can imagine in her mind she was thinking, okay, Lindsay, buck up. This is not a big deal. You're spinning yourself out. This is business. Meanwhile, Jason finally arrived in the neighborhood after doing what he needed to do, but he kept his distance as he didn't want to interfere and he really didn't think there was a problem. Hindsight, we of course know what happens and it's easy to analyze this with all the knowledge we have after the fact. But when I put myself into that situation, specifically where they are before they know anything is wrong, I can totally understand where both Jason and Lindsay are coming from. I can imagine if I were trying to meet with, say, a potential client, like a client I needed to, you know, sign, and I had my husband come as like my, I don't know, protector, something like that, who had no role in me landing the client. I would feel a little bit sheepish, to be honest. I'd feel like I was overreacting. I'd feel like, gosh, I can do this by myself. Like, what is this, the 1950s? I need my, you know, <laughs> husband here to protect me or something like that. And I can imagine that I would feel kind of strange about needing that extra layer, even if I had a spidey sense something was wrong. And on the flip side, I could see my husband thinking, okay, She's already in the client meeting. I don't want to like make a scene and come in because if you've ever been at a house showing, it's it's intimate. There's only one showing at a time. There's usually not multiple showings. So one real estate agent has one key to get in. And if someone else wants to see the house, they have to wait. That way, the people who are seeing the house have kind of full reign of the house and don't feel rushed. So you can imagine he was like, well, let me just hang back. I am here. You know, what's the big deal? They'll be out soon. And so he texted Lindsay, but she never responded. And Waiting a while, Jason drove up to the house. The door was locked, and despite knocking, no one answered. So this is when he starts getting a little worried because he's waited long enough, but he hasn't heard from Lindsay. He peered through the frosted glass window on the front door, and he thought he could see Lindsay's shoes. Meanwhile, his friend from the auto shop, who also had come with him, had found an entrance through the back. It appears there was a fence around the back, and the two men either jumped the fence or found a way through it. By now, 
Jason really started to get worried, and he called 911. But with a way into the house, he actually hung up for his 911 call. He and his friend entered the home. Jason immediately ran upstairs and found Lindsay. She was in the master bedroom, lying in a pool of blood. She'd been stabbed multiple times. The number of stab wounds has grown over time from dozens to more than 30 to more than 40 to 54 times. None of these numbers have been confirmed. We just know there was a lot of blood and she was stabbed. Even the coroner's report only says, quote, multiple times. And Brett, that might be that there were just so many stab wounds that they couldn't accurately count them. Bloody, socked footprints, one set large and one set small, were found on the stairs. The killers, like Lindsay, had also taken off their shoes. Lindsay had no defensive wounds, and the police would speculate that she was stabbed in the back in a quick sneak attack. Nothing was stolen. She hadn't been raped, violated, assaulted, but she was dead and no one knew who killed her or why they did it. And to this day, what exactly happened to Lindsay is a mystery. And this is one of those close run things. And we talk about this a lot with these cases, how easy it would have been for things to not have gone the way they do. And... You know, it's funny because sometimes we'll we'll throw out theories about things. So people are like, yeah, but I mean, a lot of stuff would have had to have gone the right way for that to be true. And it's like, yeah, absolutely. In much the same way as, as you have here. If Jason arrives five minutes earlier, Lindsay probably survives. In some tellings of the story, he literally gets there and sees the man and the woman themselves. He sees the back of them as they're going in the house. So he's right there. Either as the two were coming out the front door and they see him pulling up and then they go back in the house or literally as this is sort of starting either way, he's not going to go in because she's in it now. I mean, as Alice said, maybe if he'd have been there earlier, they could have shown it together. If you assume that Lindsay was worried about this, but there is a strong, strong bias here. If you're Lindsay against having Jason with her. For all the reasons that Alice said, just put yourself in her shoes. She want, I, I mean, look, I don't know her. I don't think I have to know her to say she wanted to do this and she wanted to do it on her own to prove it to herself and everybody else that she could. So to me, none of this is unusual. It's just unfortunate. And it's unfortunate that things lined up as perfectly as they did. But as Alice said, what a what an insane thing. This young lady goes to show a couple a house, and while she's showing them the master bedroom, she gets stabbed. A lot of times. Not sure how many, but a lot of times. And you get the same sort of descriptions you always get with this. Like, she was nearly decapitated and all this other stuff. And nobody knows for sure, because none of that's ever been released. And if you ever read anything like that, that's part of the you know, the lore of this case that's probably not true. You know, there's other people who say that she was stabbed in the breast multiple times. And then this is an indication of who did it. Another thing, completely just people saying that, no indication is true. Like I said, like I said, we don't even know how many wounds she had, but we know she was stabbed and we know it was bloody and it was bloody enough that the killers are tracking blood through the house as they're leaving. And let's put this into perspective. I know we've talked about this in other cases, but this was probably not a quick killing if there were multiple stab wounds and it takes time. I mean, gosh, I hate putting myself into these positions where I have to think about it. But this is not a gunshot wound where you can pull the trigger many times or an automatic weapon where many shots are fired. Stabbing takes physical effort. And I hate to tell you guys this, but when a knife goes into a body, it takes some effort to pull out. There's blood splatter. We've talked about this. And it, they were there long enough for the blood to pool out and to get onto their socks. That's why they tracked blood down the stairs. So this wasn't a quick like attack, like a quick stab and like run, 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 run. This was repeated and this took time and they didn't have time you know in the sense of they didn't know when someone was going to go check in on Lindsay they didn't know if there was another showing scheduled because remember Lindsay's not the going to be the only real estate agent showing this house it's possible that another real estate agent has booked it for 30 minutes out typically showings are booked for 30 minutes an hour out they're not booked for days long, you know, there, there's usually a pretty short timetable that's not even known to each individual real estate agent. So whatever it is, they're working on a short time frame, but 
they do a killing that is not in and out. The Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Brett, before we move on, I am so excited about one of our favorite sponsors, HelloFresh. You guys know that life is busy. Full-time jobs, podcast, new baby in the house. It is hard to keep my growing family fed. But with HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. This summer, HelloFresh is here to take the work out of eating well, which is so helpful with kids being out of school. Reach your goals with delicious calorie smart and protein smart lunch and dinner options, plus new vegan recipes too. Figuring out what's for dinner is not at the top of anyone's summer activity wish list, while HelloFresh delivers mouthwatering, chef-crafted recipes, and fresh ingredients to your door so you can spend your summer doing, well, whatever you want. I personally love their Parmesan crust crispy chicken. My kids think it's like fried chicken, but it's way healthier. And we have loved it so much. We've made it over and over again. And the portions are huge. Even though my boys eat so much, there's always more to spare. So go to HelloFresh.com slash TP16 and use code TP16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash TP16 and use code TP16 for 16 free free meals, plus free shipping. And find out for yourself why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take. Whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality, it can be hard just to know where to start. But now, all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. And Alice, you can turn to Angie with confidence no matter what the size of your home or the size of your project. Whether you've got a 100-year-old house like I do where it seems like things are always breaking or if you're renting and you're needing someone to help you with moving, installations, or cleaning, Angie is there for you and they're there for you with confidence. So... Angie has over 20 years of home service experience, and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with Angie's app, answer a few questions, and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish. Or they can help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly, which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Because when it comes to getting the most out of your home, you can do this when you Angie that. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I.com. Check them out today. Angie.com. A-N-G-I.com. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it is a very, it, it, this should already strike you as a very strange murder. One that seems almost inexplicable. There are couples that murder people. We'll talk about that some. It happens, you know, but I mean, this, this feels like a targeted killing. And in some ways, this is not going to make a lot of sense, but it makes sense in my head. There's a difference between a killing and a murder. You know, a lot of times murder encompasses a bunch of other things. It can be a sexually based murder, or it can be some sort of fantasy that, you know, the killer is, is living out, or it can be something driven by personal animus 
that that leads to to a a, a violent rage filled murder. There's all sort of that that goes through there. This feels like just a killing. Like this person needed to die, and these people were going to kill her, and that's what they did. They killed her, and then they left. And I, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of different things in this case, but to me. That is one of the most important things here is the way this goes down feels more like a killing than these two people had some reason that was personal to them that they were going to kill Lindsay, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good point, Brett, because up until the time they meet, Lindsay had never met the people. She only knew at least the woman's voice. And that's really interesting because if she had recognized them when she met them, it would have been a different situation. So these had to have been complete strangers to her both in voice and when she met them, because there probably would have been a different kind of a greeting, or maybe she would have sent a text to someone like, oh, did you know this was so-and-so? Or if it was someone she knew and she met them, it would have made Spidey senses go up even more. Like, wait a second, you're not Jane, you're Jill. I met you many years ago at this event. Why did you say you were Jane? So all of this is relevant because the stranger situation makes it much more like a killing than some vendetta or some, you know, passionate crime of murder. Okay, so let's talk about the timeline in this case. We're going to dwell on some of these finer points a lot, but as usual, I think the timeline holds a lot of clues, and we're going to back up a little bit. We started the story in 2008, but we're going to start the timeline in 2007 because this murder began in 2007. In November of 2007, someone buys a burner phone at a convenience store in Vancouver, Canada. Spoiler alert, this burner phone is going to become important to our case, you know, a couple months later. This is some interesting planning because, obviously, once the police were onto this case, they were looking into things like phone records, and they were looking for the phones that could have been used to contact Lindsay. And they end up at this convenience store and they ask if the convenience store has any kind of cameras. And of course they do, but they don't have cameras that go back two months. Their cameras, like most in convenience stores, record over. So the fact that whoever did this purchased a burner phone so far ahead was something that would help conceal their identity much later when this murder occurs. Fast forward to December 15th, 2007. Lindsay visits her father, Jeff Buziak in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. During that trip, Lindsay attempted to contact a relative of someone named Erickson Lopez de la Casa. Going to go with that. De la Casa. Actually, I think it's de la Cazar. De la Cazar. I'm missing an R on what I've got written down here. Some people say she tried to contact him. Some people say she tried to contact a relative. I think it probably is a relative And it's said that she visited this relative's Facebook page and she attempted to call him. The relative and De La Cazar were high school friends with Lindsay, or at least they had attended the same high school as her. So it's possible, and and I used to do this a lot when I was Lindsay's age. I mean, I still try and do it now, but I'm a good bit older now and everybody spreads to the wind. But when I would come home for Christmas in... You know, when I was in my early 20s, one of the things I'd do is I'd try and get in touch with people that I hadn't seen in a while so we could hang out, grab a drink, whatever. Kind of feels like maybe that's what's going on here. But whatever's the case, Jeff will later say that Lindsay told him that she saw something she shouldn't have. The problem with it, this is a great statement, by the way, and it makes you think all sorts of things could be going on here. The problem is, and this leads into something we started this episode with, Jeff is an unreliable narrator. And there are many people, including Lindsay's mother, who have cast doubt on Jeff's claim. And this is not the only claim of Jeff's that's going to have doubt cast on it. But nevertheless, it's something to remember that she both reaches out to these people who are related to this Delicazar person and that Jeff says that she saw something she shouldn't have. Fast forward to January 22nd, 2008. So we're still not quite to the murder, but we are to an event that is very important. Police conduct a raid resulting in the largest cocaine bust in the history of Alberta, Canada, netting 80 kilograms of cocaine worth over $8 million, 
several firearms, and half a million dollars in cash. The raid is part of an effort to break a cocaine smuggling ring from British Columbia to Alberta. This is a smuggling ring that, it has been speculated, had ties to the Mexican cartels. In fact, the Mexican cartels led by El Chapo at the time. I think his son runs it now, though I think even maybe he was arrested. Nevertheless, big Mexican cartel involved down there. And one thing that was fairly clear fairly early on during this operation is someone had given information to the police that led them to this massive cocaine bust. Eventually, and and this is going to take some time, the police are rounding up people as a part of this, and they end up arresting around 14 people as part of the takedown. But at first, they only got two, and one of them was Erickson Lopez de la Cazar of Victoria, Canada. That's on January 22nd, 2008. A few days later, the phone that was purchased in Vancouver back in November 2007 is activated. This is all very interesting, and I think this timeline, it's easy to kind of mush up the timeline. Note that the phone is activated after this drug bust, but it was purchased before Lindsay reached out to Dela Cazar or Dela Cazar's relative. So I just want you to keep things clear in your mind. February 1st, 2008, this burner phone travels to Vancouver Island, and Dela Cazar is denied bail from that previous arrest. Lindsay gets a call from a lady looking for a house for herself and her husband, and the woman says they live in Vancouver and are traveling to Victoria. And remember, this woman said that they've got money to burn. They want a nice new house that was at least a million dollars. It's a deal so good that Lindsay immediately wonders if it's too good to be true. On February 2nd at 2 p.m., Lindsay asked receptionists to search the caller's name and number in their database, but nothing comes up. At 3.30, Lindsay and Jason have a late lunch at Sauce. They pay their bill and they leave separately. They're there for about an hour. Jason asked if Lindsay wanted him to handle the showing, but she says, no, she can handle it. Lindsay swung by the apartment and changed, and Jason headed to an auto body shop, SHC Autographs, to handle another deal. And one thing I want to point out about this is Jason asked Lindsay if she wants to handle this. Obviously, we get this information from Jason. Jason isn't asking her that because he says that Lindsay was worried about this. As a matter of fact, Lindsay's future mother-in-law had asked her the same thing. Do you want me to handle this? The house, in fact, was listed with her future mother-in-law. This was part of a new development. There are a lot of new houses. As we said, her mother-in-law, future mother-in-law, was really big in real estate, and she was actually the listing agent of the house, and Lindsay is going to be the person who brings the buyers to them so you know great for the real estate agency because you're getting sort of getting on both sides but the reason they asked her this was not because she was worried it's because one of her good friends was having a bachelorette party that night in vancouver which is just across the bay this this is a very interesting geography of this area by the way like so what we're talking about vancouver island and victoria victoria is the capital of this province of canada vancouver island is literally an island there are no bridges Everybody gets there by ferry, which is just kind of blows my mind that this many people, because when I think of an island that you only get to by ferries, I'm thinking, you know, 25 people live there, but this is like a big, a big place with a lot of people. And in fact, the capital of the province, and then you've got that other city just across, (laughs) just across the bay. And so she was going to go there for a bachelorette party or she was supposed to. In fact, I think she planned it. But this was such a sort of big sell for her that she wanted to do this. And so even though people are saying, hey, we can handle this, we can cover this for you. She's like, no, 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 I want to do it. And then I think her plan was probably get to the party a little late. So at five o'clock, Lindsay is stopping by her Remax office and she speaks to one of the secretaries about the meeting. Remember, she had asked one of the receptionists to search the caller's name, see if they had anybody in the database, still trying to figure out who this person is. According to the people she spoke to with at the Remax office, she still felt uneasy and kind of freaked out about the whole thing, but she still was telling herself, I'm overreacting. This is all going to be fine. It's all going to work out. So look, we talk about lessons sometimes from true crime, and I don't want people to live their lives in paranoia and fear, but man, 
if your intuition is telling you something, listen to it. Listen to it. Because the number of times you read stories like this where people felt something and they went ahead and did it anyway and it didn't work out. I realize there are a thousand times where your intuition tells you something's wrong and everything's fine. But, you know, it's kind of one of those things where if you don't listen to it and it was right, the outcome's usually really bad. So maybe just err on the side of listening to your intuition. Lindsay obviously had some intuition about this, but she keeps telling herself, no, it's going to be okay. No, it's going to be okay. And so she decides to go through with this. At 5.30, Jason's over at the auto body shop, and he's picking up his buddy, Colin. Like I said, they play hockey together and do a lot of other stuff, and he's picking him up. At the same time, Lindsay is meeting with the two people who called her to see the house. And Jason and Colin, they are heading towards the house where she is in the process of showing it. But as I said, this is new building. The subdivision is actually new. And Colin and Jason, they're trying to find the address in their GPS and they can't find it. So Jason actually calls Lindsay to get directions. And he's on the phone with her and she's giving him directions of how to get to this house. While she is on the phone with Jason, the couple arrives and she says something along the lines of the Mexicans are here. Because remember, that's what she calls them based on the lady's accent. And at that point, Jason hangs up and now they're following Lindsay's directions to the home. As we said earlier, witnesses will tell police that they see the couple walk into the cul-de-sac. This is important. They walk into this cul-de-sac. So wherever they parked, it was out of the cul-de-sac somewhere else. They don't drive in there. They walk in. And these witnesses see the couple walk into the cul-de-sac at around 530. As we said, he was tall with dark hair and long slacks. And the lady, she had short blonde hair and a black and red dress that was described, as I said, as being fashionable, having a lot of color in it, in addition to the black, to the extent that this dress became a focus of the police. Number one, they thought, this is such a distinctive dress. And people think it's worth a lot of money. We should look into this. If we can find the designer that made the dress, we can find the people, which is just great classic police work. Unfortunately, they later find out it might have looked nice, but it was bought at like Walmart. It was like a Walmart brand, looked good, but there were a bazillion of these, and it wasn't going to help. And in fact, the police basically figured that the reason this dress was purchased was, number one, to make it look like the lady was wealthy. Number two... Any blood that got on her because of the black and red dress, you wouldn't really notice. And number three, it was flashy enough that people looked at the dress and not at the people. And so it actually hurt the police that the dress drew so much attention from the witnesses because the dress is basically useless. How very interesting. You know, it had such a great effect that I you have to you have to think that the the woman or the killers knew to pick a dress like this and it wasn't just by chance because how interesting to have a flashy enough dress that people look at the dress but not you and it's okay that they look at the dress that it doesn't somehow pin you down because it's a mass-produced dress from Walmart. It's kind of brilliant in a terrible way. So remember, Jason spoke to Lindsay just at 5.30 when he was getting directions and the couple arrived. Now, the police believe that Lindsay was attacked and killed sometime between 5.38 and 5.41, so a span of about three minutes. And they think this because at 5.38, Jason texts Lindsay, but that text is never opened. So she never clicked on it to look at it. And it might also just be that she was in the middle of showing a house and didn't want to seem rude by pulling out her phone. But whatever the reason, she does not open that text. At 541, there was a call from Lindsay's Blackberry, which police believe was actually accidental and as a result of the attack. One note back on that text that she never opened on 538, while she may have thought it was rude to pull out a phone while she's showing the house, remember, she's expecting Jason, too. And Jason was having difficulty finding the house. So if Jason were texting Lindsay, you would think that she was expecting that call or expecting that text that may be something as simple as, hey, I'm at the front door. So it is strange that she never looked at it. But because of those kind of two touch points from her phone, that's why the police believe that's when she was attacked and killed. At 5.45 p.m., Jason and his friend arrive at the cul-de-sac, 1702 D'Souza Place. Jason says the door was open to the house, and he saw the man turn and go back into the house and close the door. Jason could see figures through the glass of the front door. 
Jason and his friend park in front of the house, but they decide to back off lest he appear to be interfering with Lindsay's work. He does this despite thinking that what he just saw was suspicious. After about 10 minutes, Jason texted Lindsay, are you okay? She obviously never answered. So at six o'clock, Jason, he actually repositions his car so that Lindsay can see it and that anyone inside would be able to see it. And Jason, once again, it's been a while. I mean, this happened a long time ago. Jason is interviewed by the Murder on the Island folks, and he he presents this as less, I don't know, as the whole situation was less concerning than maybe it appears to be with the benefit of hindsight. But obviously at this point, I think Jason is getting a little concerned as well. I mean, he is texting you, are you okay? And so he does move his car up. The thought of, I don't want to interfere, I don't want to be seen, you know, I want to be here for her, but I don't want to cause any trouble, I think has now left his mind. So now he's pulling the car up so anybody can see that, hey, I'm here. If you're doing something, you need to know I'm here, right? He waits for a little while, and then both the men decide, okay, it's time to go into the house. Jason walks up to the door, and it's locked, and this is unusual. The front door should not be locked during a showing. He rings the doorbell 10 times. There is no answer. He knocks on the front door. There's no answer. He looks through the glass, and he can see shoes, Lindsay's shoes, through the front door, which is fairly common. As we've said, usually you take your shoes off when you're walking through a house. He tries the access code for the garage, but it doesn't work. He's supposed to open the garage door and let him in. It doesn't work. At this point, he's walking around the house trying to find a way in. The side door is also locked. At the same time he's trying to get in, Colin is starting to sort of circle the house as well. Jason is now very concerned. At 6.05, he calls 911, but just as he's calling them, Colin finds a way in through the back door, and so Jason actually hangs up with 911. And that makes sense, right? Because in the immediate situation, he doesn't even know what to tell 911. But he's thinking, if something's wrong, I need to get to Lindsay as quick as possible. So, you know, put yourself in that position. I can imagine just hanging up like, I don't, I literally don't know what to tell 911, but I need to get inside because it could be nothing or it could be something. Right. And the fact of the matter is, as is often the case, when he calls 911, they actually dispatch the police. Because a lot of times, when you call 911, even if you hang up, they're going to go ahead and send the police anyway because usually you don't call 911 when there's not much of a problem. So at this point, the police are actually on their way. Obviously, they don't know there's a problem. I've been calling this guy Colin, but his name's actually Cohen, so forgive me. Forgive me for that. So Cohen, he has now found a way in. He goes around to the back of the house, and it's a little unclear here. It's possible that Jason helps him get over a fence, or it's possible that Cohen goes through sort of a gap in the fence. But either way, Cohen is able to go through a back door that is open. And he goes through the back door, and he opens the front door for Jason. They go inside, calling for Lindsay, and they search the house. And Cohen, he turns around, and he starts searching the lower part of the house. This is one of those houses that has the staircase that comes down and basically runs in to the front door. Jason is going to go upstairs. So Jason goes upstairs. Cohen's going downstairs. They're both calling for Lindsay. Jason is only about halfway up the stairs when he realizes something's terribly wrong. And he can actually see from his position into the bedroom and he can see at least part of Lindsay's body slumped over. And he sees this before he even gets all the way up the stairs. So he could tell that Lindsay had been stabbed in the front several times there's blood everywhere. He tries CPR, but he can also hear air escaping through puncture wounds in her chest, which is fairly common. You hear this a lot in stabbings. People will try CPR, and they can actually hear the air leaving the body, which I just has to be. I mean, that's got to be a memory that never leaves your mind. And, and that's yeah. the situation that he's now found himself in. And so at 6.11, Jason called 911 for a second time, though he didn't know this, but police were already on the way to this home. At 6.17, paramedics and the police arrive on the scene, and Lindsay is obviously dead, and there's nothing they can do to save her. Both Jason and Cohen are taken into custody, which is typical. They are found with a dead body who's that's been stabbed. Police shut down the street and canvassed the neighborhood, though it's likely the suspects were already out of the area. And nothing happens for a really long time. 
In early of 2009, police finally ruled Jason out as a suspect. Police say that a total review of the evidence shows that Jason could not have been responsible for Lindsay's death. Police also cleared Jason's mother and brother, which it really hadn't stopped rampant speculation that they were involved. In fact, there's so much false information about Jason and his family that it's hard to wade through the sensational to reality. And basically, the case is just at a standstill. No one is arrested. There is just nothing done in the case to move towards resolution to find out who had killed Lindsay. In January of 2020, so 11 years later, the police hold a press conference in which the police say that they are now working with the FBI to use new technology to investigate this case. And they're also retesting evidence from the scene based on advancements in testing. And you hope that something comes of that. But as of this recording, there really hasn't, at least that we know of. That was three years ago. Obviously, we had a little bit of a hiccup in 2020, which might have caused some problems with the investigation. But you hope that eventually, whether it's DNA testing or what, they're going to be able to find something. Remember, stabbing is a a personal way to kill somebody. You're going to leave some evidence behind. There were footprints. Obviously, the blood was Lindsay's. But the great thing about having a murder in a new house is unlike so many houses, you would expect there not to be a ton of random DNA, fingerprints, that kind of stuff there. So you would hope that if they were able to find something, even if it was just touch DNA and not a lot of DNA, that eventually they would be able to use that as technology develops more and they can get more profiles out of a smaller DNA sample to figure out who these people are. But they have not as of yet. Well, that brings us to the end of the timeline. I think we will talk about some of the weird things. We've already talked about some of the weird things in this case, but really dive into the weird things about this case and our theories in our next episode. But if you have not heard this case, I think you know now why it is one that has really intrigued a lot of people and just feels it's just another one of those cases where, you know, this is not a case where somebody disappears and two months later they find their body. And you think, man... We lost so much time, and there's so much evidence we lost. If we only could have found things a little bit earlier. This is just, I mean, it could not have been a closer run thing. This murder happens, and Lindsay is found minutes afterwards. And the police are on the scene minutes afterwards. And the killers couldn't have been that far away, even when the murder's happening. And yet, here we are all these years later, and we don't know who killed Lindsay. Obviously, If you have any information about this case or thoughts or clues or anything, shoot us an email, prosecutorspod at gmail.com, at prosecutorspod for our social media. Thank you to all of you who support us on all the various social medias and YouTube. Thank you to those of you on Patreon who are listening early and ad-free, and obviously everybody on the gallery. We love you guys. So much fun to talk about these cases and debate things back and forth. I'm sure you're going to have lots of thoughts about this case, and I cannot wait to hear them. Alice, if you have a few minutes, do you want to answer some questions? Let's do it. (laughs) Let's do it. So if you haven't been paying attention, and it's been a little all over the place because we've recorded in a strange order, but (laughs) if you're listening to this now, you know that we're doing this thing where if you leave a five-star review, you can also ask a question in the review, and we will answer it here on the show. And we've gotten a ton of questions from you guys. So, and another thing, as some of you have noticed, if you go back and edit your old five-star review and add the question, it actually pushes your review to the top of the queue, and so we will see it. So if you left a five-star review before, feel free to go back, edit it, and add a question, and we will answer it. Okay, let's see. What is a, what, what do we have here? Okay, this is from Anna. What pets do you own now? Which pet broke your heart, and which pet would you love to own one day. Alice, I'll let you take this because I know the answer to this question. (laughs) Okay. I currently, my pets are my children. (laughs) I currently do not have (laughs) animal pets. I have a lot of human pets, but 
in a, another life before kids, I used to foster dogs and specifically kind of large, hard to place dogs. So pit bulls and German shepherds, dogs that are like, you know, 75, 100 pounds that are not easy to keep in an apartment, that sort of thing. And loved it. Absolutely loved it. They are working dogs, which mean they need a lot of stimulation, but also can cause a lot of trouble in homes where they're not getting that stimulation. So I just loved them because I felt like they were misunderstood. And it was such a good it was actually a very good precursor to being a parent because it showed that if you kind of channeled the energy correctly, you know, these could become some of the most loyal, best dogs in the world. So maybe one day when I don't have to wipe up all the things that my kids leave behind on a daily basis, I'll be able to have big dogs again. What about you, Brett? I know the answer to this, and I, I love your dog. He loves you too, Alice. He loves you too. <laughs> he doesn't, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, he's basically a, he's a hound dog. He's a, I think we think he's basically half German short haired pointer and half black and tan coon hound, which means his internal instincts are always fighting because he wants to just point silently at the animal, but he can only do that for a few seconds before he starts barking crazily like a black and tan coon hound does. So that's what he does. He's very protective of the home. So Alice doesn't really get to come over very much because he, <laughs> he will bark at her and Probably bite her if the situation was correct. But anyways, very protective. His name is Nyarla Thotep, but we call him Nyla for short because Nyarla Thotep is kind of a long name. And that's <laughs> a, for those of you who don't know, that is a character from H.P. Lovecraft, sometimes called the Crawling Chaos. So we call Nyla the Barking Chaos at times because <laughs> that's what he is. But he's a great dog. We love him very much. And, you know, which pet broke your heart? I mean, all pets end up breaking your heart because unfortunately, you know, they they get to have us for their entire lives, but we only get to have them for a, a very special period of time. So got to hold on to them when you can. All right. So let's do another one. Alice, let's see. This is from CF. Are there any cases that you two completely disagree on or have totally opposing views on? I think the answer to that is no, yeah. but I'd be interested to hear what you think. No, I, I, think, I think completely opposed, probably not, because as you can tell, if you've listened to any of our podcasts, that we don't kind of come out with snap judgments. So we talk ad nauseum. <laughs> And I think in most things in life, if you spend hours talking about something with someone, you'll find that you're not on opposite ends. It's a spectrum. And so the fact that we talk about cases like that where we're constantly conversing and it's not just a this is where I put my stake in the ground, it's it's hard to ever end up in a conversation, I think, where you're completely opposed to someone on a case. And so we have difference and nuances in how we interpret things that happen in cases based on our life experiences or our, our work experiences, what we've seen in cases. But ultimately, I don't think that we have a case where we're just totally on opposite sides of. Certainly nothing that like causes heated emotion. <laughs> yeah. Except and, that and the Atloff Pass was an avalanche. So <laughs> That's true. Alice is an ardent believer in avalanches. So, you know, in my mind, when we started this, I actually thought that would be part of it was us disagreeing on things and then we would that would be like just part of the last episode with us sort of hashing out our disagreements but we really almost never disagree i mean sometimes we have slight variations and maura murray i think you think that she got taken off by somebody and i think she she died in the wilderness but i can be convinced she got taken off by somebody so it's not even like a big disagreement there's nothing that i can think of where you are just adamantly one way and i'm adamantly another way so I don't know what that says about us, but... We're sheep? It is kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're sheep. We just follow each other. I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to think it, that we're just both so analytical of the evidence that we come to the obviously true conclusion. And both of us, since it's true, we both come to it, right? I mean, you know. <laughs> we'll stick I'm with sure that I'm sure it'll one. happen eventually. I'm sure it'll happen eventually. Okay, and last one for today. I know Alice has to get to her, her little baby. This is from Flat Nosed Pup. And they want to know what anchors you personally in a we're all mad here world. And, you know, I will say that, and, you know, you might think this is cliche, but I think it's absolutely true. Family, friends, and faith are the things, you know, like they're the things that are with you no matter how things are going. And they're the things that you better hold on to. And you should never sacrifice those things for anything else. And I read something, another cliche, but I thought it was a brilliant cliche, where somebody said, 
in 20 years, the only people who remember you worked late are your kids. And I thought, oh, that's so true, you know? And it's stuff like that. Like, And it took me a long time to get there because, you know, I mean, like most people who spent $150,000 to go to law school, you have very sort of career-focused goals for most of your life. But at this point, I, I feel like I'm a much more sort of balanced person because the things that are most important to me are you know, the, the kids who are downstairs to sleep right now, Alice, who's, you know, one of my best buds and, and making sure that my life is the kind of life that it should be in the eyes of the Lord. Yeah, I agree with you completely, but instead of kind of piling on, so I adopt what you said, I'll also say that what keeps me grounded and kind of open perspective on everything is the recognition that suffering is a universal reality in this world that we live in. I think those of you who have lived through real suffering, and I think everybody lives through real suffering, it comes at different times, it comes in different forms. But I'm not talking about like the little kind of inconveniences of daily life, but you know what it is in your life, whether it's a death, whether it's an illness, whether it's a very difficult relationship in your life. When you live through suffering, I think it opens your eyes up to the universality of it and how everyone around you is hurting and kind of fighting their own battles. And it makes you kind of just realize humanity is precious and that we need to give each other a lot more grace. And that that that's really great perspective because, like you're saying, working the late nights or doing things that don't really matter. It's okay to do those things. You shouldn't just like sit back and not do anything in life because we still have to, you know, persist in this world. But to give it the right importance, to not put your worth in your work, to not put your worth in five star reviews, one star reviews, in people who like you or don't like you, you know, people who like your voice or who don't like your voice. Those things matter so little. And so I think recognizing that truth about the world helps me prioritize and just give things the right weight in life. And when you have things weighted rightly, it doesn't mean that you are black and white, that only the most important things matter and everything else doesn't matter. That's not a correct way to live either. But I think it allows you to have this balance and the spectrum in to view the world as it should be viewed. Look at us getting all philosophical. <laughs> I know, I was about to say, now's a good time to announce our new self-help podcast <laughs> coming soon. <laughs> It is not, y'all. It is not. But we love answering your questions. And when you ask honest questions, we like to honor those questions with real answers because we're here to talk about true crime. But we also recognize that you guys give so much of your limited time to listen to us. And we appreciate that so much. So you deserve real answers. Yeah. And we love doing this with you guys. And thank you so much for sending these questions. And for those of you who reach out to us all the time on on Gmail and Instagram and, and message us. We always try and get back to you. I'm sorry if, if you slip through the cracks and we don't, but we love talking to you guys and we always do and will always appreciate you because we do not take you for granted and we do not take for granted that you do choose. Of the hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands and I don't know, millions at this point of podcasts out there that you could listen to, that instead you choose to give an hour of your life to us at least an hour, sometimes more every week. And we, we deeply appreciate that. And so we love doing this anyway. Well, Alice, is there anything else you want to add before we sign off for today? No, thank you guys for listening. There's so much more. I, you know, Brett, I thought we could cover this case in one episode. Oh, what a folly. Of course not. <laughs> There's so much to discuss here. So this is just so the typical. timeline guys come back. There's so much more to discuss. I mean, I would like to think it's a good thing, but man, as far as estimating the amount of time it's going to take for us to do anything, we're terrible at it. <laughs> but I am going to say we will finish next week. We'll wrap this case up. We're going to talk about a lot of really interesting stuff in this case and, and some, some hard stuff too. But we'll get through that next week. Hope you guys will join us for that. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. All right. What am I going to call you today? Hmm. Homely? That's probably not a nice thing to say. <laughs>
That's pretty funny, though. Uh, <laughs> not, as, not as good as Bargain Basement, Alice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm well, still okay. not going to let you put that homely. one down. I'm going to go for Homely, and you can uh, react accordingly. <laughs> 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 okay, let's see. Is that word descriptors? Is that what we call them? Superlatives. Superlatives? That's a depurlative, but okay. <clears throat> a little slow on my on laughing at my jokes today, bro. on Pluto TV, featuring hit blockbusters during popcorn summer movies. Watch Mark Wahlberg try and solve a murder in Four Brothers, or go on an adventure with an Indiana Jones movie marathon. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies, available live and on demand. Download Pluto TV 